Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here, and today I've got a very interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Custom Knife Factory and Felipe George uh, production FIF 20. This particular version sporting some beautiful Zerkatai uh, bolsters and a bronzed titanium liner lock. There, uh, I've, I've actually reviewed the older version of this knife. So there's the custom, which is the original, uh, the FIF 20 custom. There's also the larger FIF 23. Uh, I believe he, uh, Felipe Georges makes both a frame lock and liner lock version of it, but truthfully, I don't know that for sure. Custom Knife Factory uh, has done both frame lock and liner lock versions of this. In the past, there were the large and small zirconium bolstered ones. There was the, the, the large and small titanium, just the standard titanium bolstered ones. Uh, and then, you know, now this most recent run, uh, this was kind of the fancier guy. I think there's even one above this that was utilizing uh, Damasteel, right? This is M390 carbon fiber, titanium, and Zirkatai. And they have uh, a plain titanium version, which I think at the time of this review is still available in some places. Um, and then they had another uh, small carbon fiber inlay version of the exposed titanium frame lock variant and a lesser, um, you know, a less expensive uh, titanium liner lock variant with some bronze titanium bolsters. So price is kind of all over the place. We're going to talk about that. Thank you so much uh, to my generous patrons for supporting me. Um, there's a link for Patreon right down below. And please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. My buddy Kyle actually sent one of these for me to check out. And I loved it so much that I decided I wanted one. Um, in fact, I actually, uh, many of you were there for this. I actually purchased this knife live on a live, uh, it was on a live stream because Kyle was in there saying, if you really want one, I know where there's one. And uh, so he emailed me during the live stream and I, I, I bought this during the live stream. Um, this one was substantially more expensive. You are going to pay a lot of money for Zerkatai, which is not going to give you any specific benefit. It just looks nice. Um, so I'll tell you guys right now, this version was $890, but the standard version of this knife, just the titanium frame lock version is about 430. And I think the planar liner lock versions were about 450 or so. We're going to talk more about that. But just to let you know, let's proceed. Um, we'll go ahead and measure it. I think that's probably the... <laughs> The thing I usually start with. So this is the smaller one. The 23 is the larger one. I sure hope they do another run of the larger ones. Um, overall length of this guy coming in about 7.85 inches overall. Not quite 8 inches. Blade length is exactly 3.5 inches. And cutting edge is about 3.3. Nice blade to handle ratio in my opinion. Uh, let's do some size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1 and the Ontario Rat Model 2. So you can see here it's kind of in between, right? Uh, how about up against the Spyderco PM2 and the Spyderco Pro 3. So just a bit shorter than the uh, PM2. Last but not least, let's put it up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue, and its little brother, well, for, at least for, the, for my channel, uh, the uh, Bug Out. Not quite as long as the Ritter Hogue, but similar in terms of just, I guess, presence. It's it's a very different knife, but it is comparable in size to the full-size Ritter Hogue. Um, let's go ahead and do carry profile. First, I'll give you a demo of the action. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, that is some super high quality. Very controlled. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, and the blade is uh, dead centered, and uh, the lockup is absolute. You know, it's it's fantastic. These CKF knives, you know, and uh, specifically, you know, these the, the the one that I handled in the past was also just unbelievably smooth. Um, really, really high quality action. Um, not just you know gravity. It it really is. I mean, they, <laughs> some extra work went into the internals to make sure that that was going to be the case. And uh, the one that Kyle sent me is identical. There's no difference. I've experienced a lot of CKF knives, and they all are very consistent with this 
level of quality. Anyways, carry profile, thickness up against the Spyderco Para 3. You can see here it's just a little bit thicker, not crazy, but it definitely is a little bit thicker. Length and height up against the PM2 and Para 3, it's where this thing shines because um, it's a front flipper, right? So there's nothing really sticking out of it. Uh, Lengthwise, it's just a little bit longer than the Para 3. Um, and uh, in terms of height, nowhere near as tall as either. So in that sense, it should be a lot easier uh, to carry than you might expect. It should be at least as easy to carry as the PM2 and Para 3. Do a hardware uh, check real quick here. Get out my tools as per usual. My tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the um, section of my description. It talks about the tools I use in this channel. I believe the pivot is a T8. I, I adjusted this once. Um, yeah, T8. And then we have for uh, these scales here, we have a couple of T6 screws and then likely two more T6 screws underneath here for the backspacer. Um, so quite a few screws, not everything is T8, not that big of a deal, just make sure you've got quality tools in a place to put your hardware and you should be okay. Let's go ahead and measure blade stock thickness. Um, so blade stock thickness on this guy, I'm gonna guess is probably 100 and 20 thousandths, perhaps 115. Nope, it's actually more than that. It's 135 thousandths. I really wasn't expecting that. Um, really? Is that really the case? Let's try again. Mm, yeah, well, wait a second. Am I grabbing onto the raw? <laughs> well, it has to be. We'll grab a little bit further back. Yeah, okay, it's 135 thousandths. All right, it just looks thinner than that. Materials, like I said, carbon fiber, titanium, zircotai, and uh, 135 thousandths of, you know, in three and a half inches of M390. Weight, um, probably gonna be a little bit of variation in the weight. I can't remember what the all Taiwan weighed. This guy comes in at 4.16 ounces, so a bit heavier than some people might have expected, but still not really problematic, right? Not a knife I'd want to carry in athletic shorts, but you know, do what do what you want with your pants and your knives. Just be careful. <laughs> um, I think that's pretty much it. Let's go ahead and um, move into the main part of this review. This is still one of the most beautiful knives that I've ever seen. Uh, Felipe Jorge, like the designs here, it, to a lot of people they're gonna say, oh, it's so plain, it's such a straight, I like straight lines. It's very, very straightforward. And here's the deal. Let me tell you, because a lot of people, you guys might be going, didn't you buy the frame lock version? What happened to it? Yeah, I did. And I uh, realized that for the size of the knife, for me, the size of the knife, the fact that it is a front flipper only, and the fact that the frame lock version has no over travel stop, the combination of all that stuff really bothered me. I don't wanna, it's already kind of a, it's it's not an organic experience still, even though like now front flippers are pretty common, it's still less organic than, you know, deploying a knife like this, right? Or, um, you know, flipping a knife. We have a, I have a flipper that I can, right? It's still, this, this still feels a little more organic to me. So it, maybe if it was a bit bigger or the space, you, the, the exposed part of the frame lock was, maybe it was, if it was thinner, if I wasn't so concerned with where I was putting my fingers, it wouldn't have bothered me so much, but it did. Cause I, you know, when I front flip it, I really want to be holding on to it the way that I want to hold on to it like this. Well, with this liner lock version, it doesn't matter where you put your fingers, right? So I can hold it. I'm already kind of feeling like, oh, I might drop it I can hold it wherever I want and front flip it with full confidence. That's why I like this version better. So the knives are the same other than, you know, whether or not the lock is exposed. But in my opinion, the liner lock version of this knife makes way more sense. And it's the base version of the liner lock version is just a bit more expensive than the standard frame lock version. But that's, you know, if you're gonna seek one out, if you're gonna wait until they do this again, cause I think most of them are gone by this point, uh, or you're gonna seek one out in the secondary market, Personally, I would seek out the liner lock version. The fact that it did not have an over travel stop was so confusing because they both have steel lock bar inserts, right? You can see it in here. There's the chip, right? And on the, uh, the frame lock version, it also had a lock bar insert, which usually just doubles as an over travel stop. But for whatever reason, they just didn't do it. Um, so I was, I was really just not happy with the frame lock one. 
I ended up um, selling it for a little bit of a loss to a patron. That's where I sell my knives. I don't sell my knives anywhere else outside of Patreon. Um, so I took a loss and then um, just waited because I thought these were gone and then picked this guy up and I'm much, much happier. The lines are beautiful. Ergonomically, this thing, despite it's still having, this is still an issue that's, you know, present in this. Like, I pointed this out when I when I reviewed this knife the first time, the, the older version of it. It's a bit angular, like here, and it's kind of pointy up here. Very, very pointy up there. It's still a thing. But the lines in here are, are comfortable, and the pocket clip also is just fantastic. Um, it's actually pretty comfortable to hold. You're going to feel this corner and this corner, um, and you might feel this area a little bit. It really should just do more chamfering. That's that's what it needs. It's just all of these areas just need to be knocked down a little bit more, um, but you know, it's still fine, and there's plenty of access. This area right here is just beautiful. Look at all of those little corners they knocked down to make sure that this was an easy experience. No double clutch, very easy to disengage. Oh my gosh, as far as a knife, you know, a front flipper only knife, this is one of the easiest, one of the smoothest experiences, right? Normally I don't like that. And truthfully, had they added a thumb stud to this, would it'd be hard because the thumb stud would have to be in here and then it would have to travel. You can see it would, it would run right into the top of that right here. We'd have to travel around and ultimately end up right here. That would be aesthetically, that'd be the best way to do it. They'd have to, they wouldn't be able to put their logo on it. But had they done that and made this a combination thumb stud opener and front flipper, it would have just been magnificent, right? But they didn't, and that's okay. It's very, very easy to front flip. Somebody who's never handled a front flipper, I did the other day, my buddy David who um, actually, those of you who've been around since the beginning of the channel, you'll remember his uh, Begatti, um, his custom, the first full custom knife I ever handled that was on this channel uh, four years ago. Um, I handed this knife to him and he said, it, what do you mean it's a front flipper? And I said, well, uh, this is how you open it. And I showed him once and he said, okay. And he did this the first try. It was that easy for him. This is one of the best front flipper designs especially if it's the liner lock version because there's no, you don't have to worry about where you're putting pressure over here. It's just easy. Whether you're somebody who uses the tip of your thumb or you use the side of your thumb, right? Um, I kind of am in between, like where I go is about right here. And then you're pushing sort of this way, building up, you're almost letting your thumb roll around this side to build up some, build up some energy and then flipping it out. But it's so smooth. The detent is just right for this thing. Wonderful. Normally, I do not like a satin finished blade. And I probably would have pr still preferred a tumbled finish on this blade, but I do, I'll make an exception for a hand rub satin finish where these lines are horizontal. It looks much better. Um, it looks much more consistent. Um, and it makes me feel better about the money that I spent on this. And they're all like this. Um, but this is beautiful. The corners of the blade do get a bit sharp up here. So just be aware. <laughs> That's okay, no big deal. And the edge is just stupendous. This will slice. This is a laser beam. Um, absolutely, anybody who's actually gonna use this knife will find that this blade will make short work of pretty much anything. It is a very, very simple, it's just, there's a bit of a swedge up here, but it is very nearly fully flat ground and it gets very thin down behind the edge. You can get right up behind it. This is a cardboard, uh, cardboard destroyer. It's an anything destroyer, right? M390, well accentuated, the properties of M390, well accentuated by um, the geometry of the blade. I have no complaints. It is it's a perfect blade, right? I mean, it's a very plain and simple blade, but that's, you know, this is the type of blade that is kind of historically all purpose. It's just going to cut what whatever it is you're trying to cut. In here, I keep wiping this off because Zerkatai <laughs> shows fingerprints. Um, so this is like Timascus, except they've got zirconium infused in there. And this, to me, is more preferable than standard Timascus. Timascus just being lots of layers of titanium that have been anodized to bring out all the, the color and the layers. Um, but I think the um, 
the Zerka tie, which is, this is Chad Nichols' Zerka tie, um, this looks better. And the black or the gray areas in between these orange and blues and purples, this side has actually got a lot more, let me show this side. Uh, that is just spectacular. And uh, plenty strong, not gonna corrode, right? Um, but it doesn't really serve any other purpose other than just looking really good. If you're not a fan of it, they don't jam it down your throat. They make other versions of it that are less expensive. You just, they, they did anyway. Um, so yeah, in fact, like I said, the only one left I think is just the plain tie version. So if you don't like it, it's fine. You don't, you don't have to buy it. But uh, this is the version that I wanted. And I think it's beautiful. And the transition work, right, from the uh, Zerka tie to the um, carbon fiber is wonderful. They have this nice um, sort of wavy texture pattern on it that just looks great. I originally thought, why did they do a bronze liner and a bronze backspacer? I bet that'll look weird with the Zerka tie. Why didn't they just do it stonewash? No, it actually looks pretty good. The reddish purpley orange that comes out in the Zerka tie actually looks really nice with bronze. So yeah, I like it. Um, the fit and finish on this is excellent. It is perfection. Uh, really, you know, everything is seated properly. The, the only issues I have with any of this is I, I just want these chamfered down a little more. I want some of these sharp corners knocked down. These are numbered. This one here is number 99. It's of this run. And then it shows the blade steel M390 right there. Um, the, uh, the backspacer looks nice. They've got some edges sort of shaped just to give it a little bit more, right? There's more going on with this backspacer than you'd normally expect. Like they could have just done it flat and they didn't, right? looks great. This down here, I love how, you know, this line sort of narrows towards the butt and then they just kind of, they cut it. Just, it just looks nice, right? They could have just ended it right here. They didn't. All of the lines, everything flows together so well. Very, very nice. Very impressive. There's no lanyard hole, which is fine with me because the pocket clip gets to go exactly where it should, which is right in the middle, right down the middle. Looks perfect. This is a perfect pocket clip. It carries about medium. It's not too, not too deep, not too shallow, right? It's a nice groove down the middle of the clip, which just, they could have done it flat. They didn't. They went the extra mile and did it like this. This is all nicely knocked down. Continuous rise, which means it um, will, it'll rise to meet most thicknesses of pocket seam. Um, and the carbon fiber is nice and smooth, so no real issue there. In the hand, you don't notice the clip because it's flat, nicely knocked down here, even though it's thin, right? It's nice and smooth. The corners are nicely knocked down. It's funny that they knocked the edges down to the pocket clip, but still kept some of these sharper areas. The nice thing, the reason that this works even with some kind of angular edges is because this area right here will, for most people, house two fingers. It's not one of those weird one and a half finger areas, right? Or, or whatever. It's not, it's not too small. It's, it's definitely meant to house two fingers. So it's comfortable and you can get full grip on it, right? Like I said, disengagement, very easy, plenty of room because this area is higher than this area and they've knocked it out, right? Real easy to disengage. No lock stick. Oh, so smooth. The uh, the blade is perfectly centered. No detent lash. Lockout is absolutely solid. I have to touch this blade, sorry. Uh, totally solid, completely and totally solid. Um, here's our stop pin right back here. Kind of surprised that it wasn't internal, but that's okay. Um, and then no pivot lash, nothing. Super smooth, wonderful detent. A lot of you guys probably saw my top 50 greatest uh, pocket knife designs of all time, and this is absolutely on there. Very specifically, the liner lock variant. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, I broke my own rules so many times because I was like, I'm, really, I'm, not, I'm only going to do like this version and I'm not going to include the custom. I'm not going to include customs, but I'm I'm not going to include knives. Like like somebody asked me about the stitch and I was like, well, if I put the stitch on there, I'd have to put the original Borka stitch on there. Like, like if I put the Microtech stitch on there. And then I did that like with other versions like this. I put the FIF 20 by CKF on there, which is the production variant, but excluded the original custom design. So I don't know. The Felipe Jorge Fief 20 is one of the greatest pocket knife designs in existence. To me, the only things that would make this better design wise would be again to knock down some of these corners. And if it had a thumb stud, it would change the aesthetic of it a little bit so that the thumb stud could clear this area right here. But if, if there was, if he did a thumb stud version of this, I would just die. Um, this is beautiful. 
Um, you do not need the $900 version, the one that you're seeing right here. No, nobody needs to do that. But if you can find yourself, you know, the liner lock version and some, somewhere around 450 bucks, it's a bit high. Uh, it is because we are in Hinderer XM18 territory. These are made in Russia. A few of the parts, exactly how many, I don't know, but some of them, some of the parts are actually manufactured in China, but a large, you know, portion, in fact, Probably the majority of this is made in Russia. It's just really hard to say. But these are, I, the way that they list it, it's the most, you know, they are, they are manufactured in Russia with a few parts being outsourced. So they say some parts are domestic, some are not, right? So, yeah, I, I think the base versions these are, are a bit high. I think they should have been in the high 300s, but still one of the best designs of all time, um, one of my favorite production knives ever, and recommendable. You're gonna pay a little bit, a little bit more than you're comfortable with, but very, very recommendable. The liner lock version. Just to be clear, again, I'm not a really big fan of the frame lock version. Thanks to Kyle for pushing me over the edge on this one. Uh, this was an expensive one, but I'm very happy to own it, and I will keep it forever. Um, that's gonna be pretty much it today. So this is gonna go in uh, two playlists recommended knives and my favorite knives of all time because it is, it's one of my favorites ever. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do of course have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that metal complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching everybody and have a great day.